presentation on the Philippine drug situation. Our speaker is not new to the anti-drug advocacy, having served as a dangerous drug board's deputy executive director for operations prior to his appointment as chairman. He entered the government workforce as a public health advocate, previously working at the Department of Health. In 2003, he became the OIC of the National Center for Health Promotion at the Department of Health. In the following year, he was appointed Supervising Health Program Officer. Later, he became part of the Office of the Undersecretary for Health Operations as Program Manager. He is an expert in the fields of public health, development management, and drug abuse prevention and treatment. Let us all welcome Dr. and Secretary Benjamin Pireyes, Chairman of the Dangerous Drugs Board. Thank you, sir. Thank you and uh, good morning. And uh, at the onset, uh, let me say that I'm privileged to be presenting the drug situation uh, among colleagues and uh, esteemed guests today. And uh, let me also take the opportunity, although I'm all, only tasked to present the drug situation in the country, but uh, let me take the opportunity, if time will permit, to also present to you our uh, drug policy and some of what we're doing in the campaign. Um, can we have the slides? I'm happy to note uh, that uh, Sir Mike Tan mentioned that this forum is not an anti-government forum. And so it relieved me of the, some of my apprehensions. Uh, and I also agree 100% with our keynote speaker, Dr. Calamart, no? that uh, everything should be, our policy should be evidence-based and rights-based. Can we have the slides? Okay, that's it. And so this allows me the opportunity to also educate everyone about what we're doing in government. Unfortunately, right now, uh, most of what we are seeing is uh, focused on the enforcement side of the campaign. But let me assure you, uh, the Philippines has one of the most balanced policy document in Asia. No? And we're doing so many things on the demand side. And uh, later, if time permits, I will also present them to you. So first, uh, the current drug situation. I'll just touch on some of the key uh, information as uh, presented in the World Drug Report published by UN in 2016. Well, worldwide, we have 247 million people who are, who, who are using drugs. One out of 20 people between 15, uh, ages uh, 15 years old to 64 years old. And this represents an increase of 1 million over the previous uh, data. But uh, overall, our drug problem worldwide is still considered stable. And this, uh, this is uh, also the same in Asia. No? The World Drug Report considers the drug problem in Asia stable. Next slide, please. So just to, just to present to you some of the graphics. No? So 247 million drug users worldwide. Next slide. That's about... 5.1, a uh, 5.2% prevalence rate, no? And out of that number, around 0.6% are considered problematic drug users. So these are people who may require inpatient treatment and rehab uh, programs. No? Next slide. Also to show you that uh, marijuana is the, the number one drug of choice worldwide, followed by opiates, no? Next slide. Okay, and just to mention that there is a growing synthetic drug problem, uh, especially in the Southeast Asian region. Next slide. But it's now uh, increasing in parts of North America and Europe, including Oceania. Next slide. Now, between 2008 and 2015, a total of 644 new psychoactive substances have been reported by 102 countries and territories. Now, some of these psychoactive substances are not regulated. Next slide. 
In 2015, an estimated 12.2 million total number of uh, people who inject drugs worldwide was reported. Now, uh, globally, I think uh, uh, people, uh, uh, the numbers of uh, people who inject drugs are uh, getting stable. No? Uh, most of the countries who have experienced this problem are already uh, addressing the issue. Unfortunately, there are still nine countries which, who presents an increasing trend as far as people who inject uh, drugs are concerned. No? And the Philippines is, is one of those countries. Okay. Next slide, please. Now let's go to the Philippine situation. In 2015, the Dangerous Drugs Board uh, commissioned a survey. It was revealed that there are around 1.8 million Filipinos who are using drugs, and that's around 2.3%. Remember, the global prevalence, as I presented earlier, was around 5.2. And in the Philippines, we have around 2.3 uh, prevalence rate. Uh, so with a margin of error of plus or, minor, what, plus or minus 1%, so the numbers can go as high as 3 million in the Philippines. Now, some intelligence reports would suggest that the figure is around 4 million, and this is according to enforcement data. Majority of the users were males, employed adults with at least a high school education. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, majority of the users comes from the Visayas region and uh, followed by the National Capital Region and then by Mindanao. Uh, in the Philippines, substances being abused now appears to be, number one, marijuana, then followed by methamphetamine, shabu, and then surprisingly, cocaine is already into the, in the picture, no? but usually taken in combination. However, shabu still owns the highest share in mar market value and prevalence in uh, rehabilitation facilities. Next slide, please. Just some of the demographics. We have a female, male to female ratio of seven is to one, according to the survey. And uh, most of them with family incomes ranging from 50,000 to 80, 87,000 pesos. And as I mentioned, uh, the number three drug of choice, number one is uh, marijuana, shabu, cocaine. Previously, the data uh, uh, was, uh, the, as, as far as the substances of abuse are concerned is, Number one is marijuana, shabu, followed by inhalants. No? That was in the previous surveys. Next slide. Okay. A similar survey was conducted by UP Population Institute, but this time among youths ages uh, 15 to 24 years old. And according to the, uh, to the findings, no? uh, we have a prevalence rate of around 3.9%, and this is in uh, 2013. Okay, next slide. So as far as estimates of the drug industry is concerned, uh, according to the 2015 survey, the drug industry was estimated to be around 55 billion nationwide. But according to intelligence reports, it may be more. No? It was pegged at around 120 billion. Next slide. Just to show you the trends in admission in uh, inpatient rehabilitation facilities. So from 2010 to 2016, there is an increasing trend. No? But the uh, number is only around uh, 6,079. Next slide. Majority of those admitted in rehabilitation centers were new users, new admissions, followed by readmissions or the relapsers. No? And uh, uh, um, as you can see, the uh, green bar uh, pertains to outpatient admissions. And unfortunately, we have a very low admission rate as far as outpatient facilities are concerned. Next slide. Okay. Now, these are institution-based data comparing 2015 and uh, 2016. You will note that we more or less have the similar demographics no? of persons being admitted in uh, treatment and rehab centers. So the mean age is around 21 years, uh, 31 years old. Uh, 
We have a male to female ratio of admission, uh, 14 is to 1 in 2015, slightly improved in 2016, 13 is to 1. Uh, most of those admitted are single, unemployed, at least they have reached college level. No? But if you look at the drugs and substances of abuse, most of those admitted in rehab facilities primarily use methamphetamine, followed by marijuana, and again, cocaine. So cocaine is uh, really in the picture. No? Next slide. Uh, actually, this is not updated. Now we have 49 rehab facilities. Uh, and unfortunately, we only have three non-residential facilities as of 2016. Next slide. Now, uh, this figure comes from the Department of Health, the Integrated Drug Testing Operations Management Information System. The system collates all drug testing activities done by drug testing laboratories nationwide. No? And it, 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 is, uh, the, uh, it is compiled uh, in the Department of Health. So every year we test around 4 million individuals. And out of that number, a few thousands no? uh, test. And this is uh, screened, no? screening and confirmatory tests. We're, we're doing screening and confirmatory tests. Only a few thousands, uh, more or less 0.1% prevalence rate, positivity rate. No? Next slide. Now let's look at enforcement data. As you can see again, from 2011 to 2016, there is an increasing number of operations being conducted by the enforcement sector. In 2016, it increased by 29%, uh, uh, more especially during the second half of the year when the uh, new administration uh, assumed. No? Next. Numbers of personalities arrested. Uh, the data came from PIDEA from 2010 to 2016. There's a, uh, an increase, no? So we arrested 27,943 individuals in 2016. Next slide. Again, just to show you, uh, most of those uh, arrests happened during the administration, the current administration. And unfortunately, we also arrested some government officials, no? law enforcers themselves, 195, elected officials, 274, government employees, 373. Next slide, please. Okay. Seizures of uh, shabu, of methamphetamine, increased in 2016 by 319%. And this is, uh, all, uh, the, the increase is also evident during the second half of the year. Next slide. Same, same with dismantling of Shabu laboratories. Uh, we dismantled 10 laboratories in 2016. That accounts for a 400% increase. No? Next slide. Eradication of marijuana sites increased by 18%. Next slide. Seizures of ecstasy, surprisingly, increased by 649%. And uh, just to let everyone know, I think you're all aware of the uh, close-up e event where uh, five people died in, in SM MOA. No? Uh, ecstasy was uh, identified as one of the uh, substances that were used. No? Next slide. Cocaine were observing an increase of seizures of cocaine, especially coming from Asian countries and uh, entering the Mindanao region. Next slide. Marijuana leaves again. Seizures of marijuana leaves increased in, 2015, in 2016. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Similar with marijuana sites, yeah? It was already presented, next slide. Next slide, please. Dismantling of Shabu Laboratories, yes. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. As far as conviction rates are concerned, unfortunately, uh, we have a very low conviction rate. No? Uh, it's only around one-third no, of all the cases being filed. And unfortunately, the number one reason for uh, dismissal of cases, as you can see at the bottom bar, is the non-appearance of prosecution witnesses. 
And so we're trying to improve the conviction rates. Next slide. Okay. Now, uh, the next information was presented during the forum that was conducted in uh, Sofitel last week. And uh, it presents to you the number of estimated uh, users coming from the intelligence uh, reports. No? So as of April, uh, intelligence would tell us that we have around 4 million users, still below the 5.3, 5.2% uh, 5 uh, worldwide prevalence. So far, we have already 1.2 million surrenderies nationwide, and uh, 88,940 drug pushers have also surrendered, resulting to a reduction of index crime of around 28.57%. Next slide. Just to show you uh, the regional uh, distribution of those who surrendered, majority of those who surrendered uh, comes from the National Capital Region, uh, followed by uh, the Cordillera region. No? So if you, have, if you want this data, I can uh, leave it to the organizers. No? Next slide, please. Now, now out of 53,503 drug operations conducted by the enforcement sector, only 2,692 died during these anti-drug operations. No? The rest of the reported deaths are considered homicide cases still under investigation. We actually do not want to use the term extrajudicial killings because EJ case would connote that government is sanctioning these killings. And again, I assure you, we do not condone EJ case. No, in fact, the president during his ASEAN speech last Saturday reiterated that Philippines is still a country ruled by law. Next slide. please. So, the rest of the deaths are considered homicide cases. We have 9,432 cases, 1,847 of which have already been uh, investigated by government. 1,894 are non-drug related, and the rest, 5,691, are still under investigation as of today. Next slide. Again, just to show you the regional distribution of those killed and arrested as of January 31. Next slide, please. On the part of government, uh, PNP personnel suffered 35 deaths with 87 uh, officers uh, being wounded in, this, in, in those operations that I mentioned earlier. As far as the armed forces of the Philippines is concerned, they suffered three deaths and around 20 wounded soldiers. Next slide. There is an ongoing internal cleansing being conducted by the Philippine National Police, and part of that internal cleansing process would be to check uh, the, the enforcers no, for uh, drug use. And so far, 197 individuals have already been uh, dismissed. Next slide. As far as uh, Directorate for Investigations Counterintelligence Unit is concerned, they have provided us, as of January 29, with this, with this watch list. They're now looking into 1,181 enforcers nationwide. So these, are, uh, these people are being investigated, and uh, 21 have already been administ administratively charged. 21 have been uh, criminally charged. Uh, 21 have died. Uh, and the latest to be charged, and I think you're all aware of this, last week, the DOJ Prosecution Office charged former PNP uh, anti-illegal drug group head Colonel Rafael Dumlao and four of the police officers involved in the kidnapping and killing of Korean businessman G. Ik Ju. No? So just to show everyone, we do not condone these killings. And we, if you feel that your rights have been violated, then report them no? so that we can investigate and uh, take appropriate ne the, ne the necessary action against these uh, policemen. Next slide, please. So what's the status of the drug campaign? Where are we now? Huh? Next slide, please. We all agreed 
No, in the Dangerous Drugs Board, well, the Dangerous Drugs Board being the highest policy-making body um, as far as dangerous drugs is concerned, that we need to look into the establishments and institutionalization of systems rather than focusing on numbers and activities. We need to determine the impact of our existing processes and provide measurable indicators to determine progress. Next slide. And so, we decided that we need to revise the previous national anti-drug strategy. And as I mentioned to you, this national, this NADPA, no, the national anti-drug program uh, of the previous administration is one of the most balanced uh, uh, pol drug policy document that uh, uh, in Asia. No? And uh, let me assure you that it conforms with all UN international standards. No? So we want to strengthen supply and demand initiatives uh, by the government, review and amend law and laws and policies, establishment, we need to establish systems at the local government uh, level, and uh, we came up with the new Philippine Anti-Illegal Drug Strategy, which, was, which will be presented in Malacanang on Monday. Huh? Sige, next slide, please. The new Philippine Anti-Illegal Drug Strategy harmonizes the strategies and targets and deliverables identified under the social development agenda and also the national security policy of the Duterte administration. So we, we want to present the convergent systems that will, be, that will support the Philippine anti-illegal drug strategy implementation. We want to enhance existing pillars of action and we have identified five pillars of action, the supply uh, pillar, the demand pillar, the civic awareness uh, pillar, the alternative development pillar, and the international cooperation pillar. And as mentioned by our uh, keynote uh, speaker earlier, we adhere to international laws and agreements. No? So the period of implementation of the PADS will cover the administrations, uh, well, the Duterte administration from 2016 to 2022. And uh, we want to include, this time, the PADS will include quantitative targets and uh, which were not included in the old NADPA. No? And we want to revitalize, expand roles, uh, delineate roles of government agencies under this strategy. Next slide. Okay. So, let me assure you that the strategic approaches in this document, in this document are evidence-based, culturally appropriate, comprehensive and balanced, and it would entail participation from all sectors. That's the reason why the president is pushing for more community-based programs. No? He, he wants the faith-based organizations to join the campaign, other NGOs. No? Next. So the goal of the new uh, document is to promote the continued adoption of the five-pillar approach, assure alignment to current international and national plans, policies, trusts, and priorities, and incorporate available principles and tools provided by prevention science and latest evidence-based treatment modalities. And in fact, we have already several community-based models uh, being implemented nationwide. No, and for the first time, uh, May 11, we will be launching a uh, gender-specific uh, CBT program, which will be piloted, cognitive behavioral therapy program, which will be piloted in uh, Bikutan Treatment and Rehab Center. Uh, later on, we will be expanding this female-specific program to community-based programs. Next slide, please. And so what are the challenges as far as uh, the Philippines is concerned? Well. We have, the, uh, of course, globalization, the, in, the ASEAN integration, emergence of new psychoactive substances. According to USDA, we're looking at 15 new substances every week. No? And so we need to adjust and adapt our strategies. Uh, the, we also have a problem of increasing uh, uh, persons who inject drugs, as I mentioned earlier. And right now, uh, the Department of Health is looking into programs that would uh, address this particular issue, specifically in the Visayas region. No? We need to expand access to services, and so 
if you're looking at 4 million drug um, problematic drug users, and if according to the World Drug Report, around 0.6%, or maybe we can round it off to 1%, would be requiring inpatient programs, then we're looking at around 40,000 individuals requiring inpatient facilities. Right now, we still have four regions without an inpatient facility. And as I presented to you, right now, we only have three outpatient centers nationwide. And so the goal is to increase community-based programs, increase those outpatient facilities, and improve access to re in regions where inpatient rehab centers have not yet been uh, uh, provided. No? So we want to institutionalize community-based level interventions, wider access to varied levels of services, and age and gender-specific programs. Right now, we, are, we only have two female facilities, no? uh, one in Bikutan and one in, in the Visayas region. But uh, hopefully, by the end of uh, this year, uh, the one in Bicol will already be uh, operationalized. And there is also a plan to have a female faci facility in Bataan. Next slide, please. So currently, treatment and rehab is still not yet covered by the health insurance. And we have been discussing this with uh, PhilHealth, and I think they are amenable. It's just that right now, they still don't have a chairman <laughs> appointed. But uh, it was already included in the recently approved mental health bill that health-related problems will now be covered by field health. And so it's just a matter of uh, ironing out the details of how we can implement this. No? And mental health includes drug use, no? drug abuse. So it should be uh, subsumed in the primary health care. Again, as I mentioned, should be community-based. Unfortunately, uh, we have a lack of policy issuance from the health sector, but I was in informed that uh, community-based guidelines were already drafted by the Department of Health. And uh, we are encouraging this, despite the fact that those guidelines will go against the provisions of the law, Republic Act 9165. Just for the information of everyone, under our law, if you want to volunteer for treatment, you still need to secure a court order. You know? And we believe that's not right. No, so despite the fact that um, it's in the law, the Dangerous Drugs Board issued several regulations bypassing this provision of the law. No? So far, uh, nobody has questioned or uh, questioned the regulations issued by the board in courts. And we're happy for that. And we believe they know uh, what we're doing would be for the benefit of the patients. Similarly, community-based programs, uh, we are allowing community-based programs without court orders. No? They can volunteer on their own volition. And so we're looking at the whole continuum of care being provided to substance use uh, patients. No? And so detox is already covered by the health insurance, but uh, we want the primary programs to also be funded no? by, by field health. And so we're also trying to strengthen monitoring and assessment of implementation. Unfortunately, right now, there is no system to monitor the number, the, the number of surrenderies availing of services at the community level. But we have already piloted the IDIMRIS. It's a system for local government units. It was already tested. And uh, we are rolling this out by June so that we can monitor the services being provided at the local at the community level so we need to process and validate mga our program modification systems and we are now developing and adapting un validated tools next slide please okay so just to show you some uh, it may be too small for you no but uh, just to show you some of the priorities under the new Philippine anti-illegal drug strategy. So again, institutionalization of community-based programs, uh, government subsidy for treatment and rehab, inst institutionalization of drug-free workplace programs, institutionalization of uh, intervention testings, full implementation of anti-drunk and drug driving act, 
which was already approved in 2013 with IRR but not being implemented in the country. Uh, review of existing uh, board regulations, re updating of the NADPA, as I mentioned, we already have the draft, uh, new Philippine anti-illegal -dr drug strategy, review of existing LGU issuances, and development of a communication plan, which will happen this June. We need to communicate what we're doing. We are not limited to the enforcement uh, side of the campaign, no? and unfortunately, that's the that's what media is covering right now, the, the only the enforcement aspect of the campaign. We're implementing 24 prevention and training programs, uh, we, programs that have been approved by the Colombo Plan and the uh, UN. No? Next slide, please. And so it's more fun in the Philippines. Do you agree? <laughs> no, okay. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much. If you have questions, I'll be happy to uh, address them.